Dozens of major studies have been published in the last few years that indicate that the chemicals in cannabis in the lab and in animals, have a significant effect on fighting almost all major cancers, including brain, breast, prostate, lung, thyroid, colon, skin, pituitary, melanoma and leukemia cancers. They do this by promoting the death of cancer cells that have forgotten how to die, as well as reduction in their crucial blood supply, while leaving healthy cells untouched. But why, you may wonder, would cannabis have any effect on cancer? The answer can be explained in one word. Endocannabinoids. Amazing as it sounds, we're all born with a form of cannabis already in our bodies. It's called the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system, or ECS, influences multiple physiologic processes. This intricate system modulates energy intake, as well as nutrient transport, metabolism and storage. A completely natural collection of compounds, endocannabinoids are our body's own form of marijuana, and are involved in most of our cells and structures. They control a variety of functions in the nervous system, heart, reproductive, and immune systems. In all animals, the nervous system is made of the same components. Large numbers of nerve cells carrying electrical signals. And wherever these cells meet, the signal is passed to a receptor in the next cell by a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. Across the brain, there are different types of these neurotransmitters, such as dopamine and serotonin. In contrast to classical signaling, where information travels from pre- to post-synaptic neurons, the ECS uses retrograde signaling. The information travels from post- to presynaptic neuron. All animals, from fish to donkeys to humans, have inherited this basic structure. But way back in time, the sea squirt evolved an innovation to this system. What happened was, the uh, nervous system acquired a new chemical, a chemical, if you like, that had a new flavor, a new, a new, new, new type of chemical, and it's this chemical that is uh, related in structure, right. has a similar shape to the chemical that's found in cannabis. Because of this similarity, these new signals came to be known as cannabinoids. It was inevitable that eventually cannabis would meet its perfect partner, us. Whether you like it or not, each and every one of us is fundamentally wired to respond to cannabis. Now, receptors are not built in our brain or anywhere in our body, of course, or animal, animal bodies, because there is a plant out there that will produce a compound that acts on them. That just doesn't work that way. Receptors are found in our body because we produce compounds that will activate those receptors. So obviously we thought that there should be uh, endogenous compounds which act on those receptors. The fact that there is a plant compound, a tetrahydrocannabinol, a THC, which acts on those receptors is just a quirk of nature. After scientists discovered THC, they found that it could bind to specific receptors in the brain and the area around it, and that this interaction created a cascade of biological processes, leading to the well-known high. What does it feel like? It looks very enjoyable. My God, it's fun! It's amazing! Amazing! If you block the endocannabinoids artificially in mice, they tend to grow tumors, and they also get depressed. A few years ago, some brilliant entrepreneurs came up with the idea of blocking the endocannabinoids in our body to create a new diet drug. The theory being, if cannabis gives people the munchies, then blocking the endocannabinoids would make them lose their appetites. The drug they developed, Remonibant, did indeed reduce appetite by blocking the endocannabinoid receptors. But data from clinical trials showed that Remonibant users suffered depression, anxiety, insomnia, and aggressive impulses 
at twice the rate of subjects given a placebo. In one study, there were five suicides amongst remonaban choosers, because, as they discovered, endocannabinoids are also mood regulators, with the capacity to make us feel euphoric, or when blocked, depressed. Remonabant was finally withdrawn from the market in 2008. Researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas reported that mice on remonabin developed potentially cancerous polyps at a far higher rate than controls, confirming that endocannabinoids are not only mood regulators, but tumor regulators as well. My good Italian friend Di Mauzo summarized the activity, which is really a summary, says, well, what do the endocannabinoids do? They relax, help us eat, sleep, forget and protect. Not remember, forget. And don't think that forgetting is less important than uh, uh, recalling. We, we should have a system to forget, otherwise we'll, if you wish we can burst. If you go down a mall and see a thousand faces, do you want to remember all of them? Of course not. What's especially fascinating is that while significant numbers of endocannabinoids are not normally found in breast and prostate cells, the homes for the two leading forms of cancer, it appears that large quantities show up only after normal cells begin to progress towards a state of uncontrolled growth, in a desperate attempt to restrain the tumorous invaders. The endocannabinoids already in our bodies, did an efficient job for hundreds of thousands of years, working as tumor regulators, free radical scavengers, and anti-inflammatory agents. But then, once we entered the industrial age, with all its pollution and chemical doctoring of food, the endocannabinoids became overwhelmed, and couldn't keep up with the task of keeping us healthy and protected from toxins. Better public health helped us live longer, but unfortunately, human beings became inundated with the free radicals our bodies produced naturally, by simply being alive along with an unprecedented avalanche of carcinogens and contaminants, including pharmaceutical drugs. The endocannabinoids needed help. Enter Cannabis. When marijuana is consumed, and broken down into a collection of cannabinoid molecules, the THC and its sisters seek out and bind with the endocannabinoid receptors already inside us. Together, they give the body more ammunition against all the diseases of modern times. And uh, let me show you what you have. So, this is an image from our subject from today. The receptors are highlighted in what color? In bright red. Well, any color oh, that you nice. see, th there are receptors. Uh -huh. uh, and red is the really dense areas. And you can see there's a lot of red and yellow. Green and blue are the really uh, not dense areas where there are not many receptors uh, in our brain. It's so they really are everywhere? Yes, yes. <laughs> right into the brain. Look how hot that is. Wow. Right in the brain. But there's also cannabinoid receptors in the liver. Also, look at the bone marrow, uh, the vertebral column, the ribs. So how do you think what we're seeing here in this image, how does that relate to the experience of using cannabis? Well, um, look at the amount of cannabinoid receptors in the brain. A lot of them. A lot of the effects of cannabis use are in the brain. Scientists are now experimenting to see which parts of the pot plant including its cannabinoids and other biological compounds, might be the most effective against a variety of diseases, including diabetes and cancer. 